Okay, our final plenary talk before we move on to the late-breaking trials uh, is entitled Fenestrated EVAR with 3D CTA Image Fusion uh, to be presented by Dr. Mark Schirmerhorn. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to pr present this video. My disclosures. So I'm going to show uh, how we use this uh, vessel navigator system of 3D uh, CTA uh, image uh, fusion to facilitate a fenestrated EVAR. We start by doing segmentation, where we simply hover our mouse over the vessels of interest and click to highlight them and select them for use as a roadmap. And we select the aorta, the iliacs, including the hypogastrics, the visceral renal segments, and then even the femoral bifurcation so we can check whether our puncture is uh, above the bifurcation without having to use uh, contrast injection. Once we have this done, we scroll through in an axial image to make sure that the highlighting has been successful in all the vessels that we're interested in. And then we move on to step two, which is the planning stage. So we place ring markers at the origin of each of the uh, branch vessels that we're interested in. And on the right, you can see how we can make some uh, fine tuning uh, of these to get them right up against the aortic wall. And we do these at the uh, renals, the viscerals, and then also for the hypogastrics. And then even uh, we put a mark down at the femoral bifurcation, again, just to help us stay above that uh, with our puncture. Once we have all of our marks in place, uh, we then look at uh, the correct C-arm angles that are going to show us those origins best, and those ring markers really help us with that. And we can store all of those C-arm angles for later recall at the bedside. All of this part can be done well ahead of time. And then we do a quick fluoro CT spin with the patient on the table, and then we take that fluoro CT on the left and match it to the preoperative CTA on the right by finding uh, pairs of uh, or pieces of calcium uh, that we identify on each of the two that are in the exact same location. We need at least three matched pairs, uh, but I typically will do six or seven, focusing on the area of interest in the visceral renal segment. We then double check that all of these overlap when we've got the system set up so that the two are together. And now we're ready for live guidance. We can see our puncture above the bifurcation. We pass a wire uh, up through the aorta into the thoracic aorta, and then we position our device and uncover it, and then we're trying to cannulate the uh, right uh, renal fenestration, and then through our ring marker into the uh, preoperatively mapped uh, right renal artery. We pass a catheter out, and this is the first contrast injection that we performed uh, for this patient. We then switch for our stiff wire, and then we deliver a sheath. In this patient, we had to use a balloon to facilitate uh, sheath placement. We then uh, pass our ICAST stent into position and then uh, move over to the left. You can see that we have the graft slightly high as we uh, typically do. Easy to pull the graft down, hard to pull, push it up uh, into the left renal and then simply advancing the catheter again. Uh, one more small puff and then we deliver the sheath and position an eye cast in the left renal. We'll pull that sheath down on the right now to get that ready to go and then deploy the top cap and withdraw the delivery system and then balloon our uh, proximal sealing zone and then deploy our eye cast stents uh, first here on the left and after deployment we will uh, flare the uh, portion that uh, extends into the aortic lumen and perform a, a puff. There's a little bit of renal artery spasm. We'll see that on the right as well. Initial deployment followed by flaring in the aorta. You can see how our ring marks line up uh, very nicely with the uh, anatomic origin. After this, we perform our first digital subtraction angiogram showing the patency of the uh, SMA right at that ring uh, location, patency of the renals, so no obvious uh, uh, type one or three uh, leak. And then before deploying our bifurcated system, one last puff to make sure that those uh, renals, uh, uh, the spasm has resolved. And then we proceed uh, with the standard bifurcated uh, uh, lower uh, graft with cannulation of the uh, contralateral limb. This patient had had the hypogastric uh, coiled preoperatively, so we extend this limb down below that. And then perform a retrograde injection. 
and then we puff the right to show the hypogastric, which is not where it is uh, uh, imaged on the uh, roadmap, uh, but we're able to localize it perfectly, and then perform one uh, final uh, contrast injection showing uh, patency of the visceral and renal segment and that right hypogastric, uh, and we're done. And thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to show this, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Very nice. Very nice. Um, I noticed that you did your Dyna CT with the patient prep uh, before the patient was prepped and draped. Does that make any difference um, as, as far as movement? I mean, it's going to match to the skeletal anatomy anyway, right? Um, yeah, so it's not so much the skeletal anatomy because we like to use, there are two ways of doing it. You can use the, the bones with 2D uh, registration, but we prefer 3D registration using flex of calcium in the aortic wall. Um, yeah, and doing it before or after the drape, we've done it uh, both ways. Uh, as long as no one moves the patient while they're uh, prepping and draping, then, uh, then, it's, then it's fine. Dr. Edelman, podium yep. number two. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Beautiful presentation. I guess I'm going to ask the question that most people in the room are thinking, which is how do we get one of these things? <laughs> Uh, I've been working on a prototype for the last uh, four or five years, but it's now commercially available, so you can talk to your Philips rep, uh, and it's, it's, it's being sold widely now. There are some text-to-screen questions. Uh, one technical question on the volume of contrast used for your uh, CTA. Um, so we, uh, for the intraoperative, we actually don't use any contrast. It's a, it's a non-contrast scan. And that's why we're using the uh, pieces of calcium in the wall of the aorta uh, and also, you know, calcium at the origin of the visceral renal vessels. Um, so zero contrast. In fact, for that case, the total contrast dose was about 50 cc's. Uh, why misregistration of the right hypogastric artery? So uh, uh, great question, a very important point. Whenever there's a lot of tortuosity and then you introduce a stiff device through it, it's going to change that shape. And so if you have a lot of angulation up at your proximal neck, it's going to rotate those visceral and renal uh, vessels somewhat. This was a reasonably straight uh, uh, aorta up at the uh, renals, so there was no uh, uh, mismatch there. But for the hypogastrics in general, there's always some tortuosity there. So I don't, I would not deploy a graft, uh, uh, you know, and, and try to land a device above the hypogastric based solely on the vessel navigator. I would always uh, puff some contrast there. Podium number two, please. Raghu Motkan Hollywood from Indianapolis. Uh, great talk. How do you account for uh, mismatch that may result from uh, respiratory movements or from putting your stiff wires inside? Uh, uh, great question about the respiratory movement. So uh, if you noticed when the uh, uh, the, the road-mapped uh, uh, renal arteries, you know, were out like this, because, or uh, sorry, are down, and then during the case when we do an angio, the renal arteries are like this, and that's because during a CT, there's an inspiration breath hold, and on the table when we do an angiogram, they unplug the uh, ET tube and it's a complete expiration, and so the renal arteries will go up and down here, but the renal artery origins never change, and so those ring markers are always right on. Um, in terms of the stiff wires, is sort of what I was talking about with the hypogastric, where uh, if it's a reasonably straight vessel, it'll have no impact, but if there's a lot of angulation, then it will definitely have an impact. You can still use this, though, to uh, show you what angle to put the C-arm in to show the, the, the renal arteries best. You also don't, you know, the roadmap stays with you as you move the table or the C-arm. Uh, and then so you can get everything in position, magnification, so that you're looking exactly at the vessel you want before you step on the fluoro pedal. Another text to screen, how often do you have to adjust the overlay during the course of the procedure? Uh, minimally. It's, we have to do the adjustment if there is that issue where there's tortuosity that we have straightened. But other than that, uh, we shouldn't have to do it at all. One from podium two, question. Uh, Rumi Pfizer, University of Minnesota. Uh, we came out and visited Mark maybe a year and a half ago and finally got our system installed. And honestly, that's a beautiful presentation. It's a game changer. And we've been doing this on awake patients as well. We'll start by putting a catheter out in the renal so we can deal with changes in alignment with awake patients. And uh, Mark, I got to say that that's, it's, it, it's completely changed how we do these EVAR cases. So thanks for bringing that to us. Thanks.